Cheers, queers. We have another special Big Gay Book Club episode. Today, we are talking to Chloe Spencer, the talented author of Haunting Melody. Welcome to the podcast, Chloe. Hi, thanks for having me here. It's really exciting to be here. <laughs> we are so excited to talk to you. I think your book has now become one of my favorite paranormally books. It's one of my favorite things to read, so I was really glad that we got to read it. Oh, that's that means that means the world to me. I wanted it to be like a very fun, like paranormal story that people could get into. And I, I love hearing that it's uh, that it's connected with you. And I love hearing that it's connected with this, a lot of readers so far. I was I was really actually kind of um, surpri surprised by that a little bit. But yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah. No, truly, you did an amazing job. And in the book, one thing that we like as the big energy podcast is that you had a lot of representation in this book and uh you included it in a way that didn't make it the sole focus of the story so when you were crafting haunting melody how did you figure out what to include to make people feel seen without like consuming the story that's a really good question i think that i was just trying to i was trying to figure out like what these characters would be naturally um, Cyrus was actually kind of based on somebody that I met at a lesbian bar one night, um, I who I unfortunately, she was very lovely. I don't even remember this woman's name, but, um, cause I ran away to get tacos cause I had been having a few drinks. Um, so, uh, but, um, like that, that particular woman that I met, uh, was a butch woman. And so I was like, I, I remember doing a lot of reading over the past couple of, of uh, years and particularly in the YA space, I was like, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of representation for like mask and butch people. And I'm, I'm very femme and I feel like I can speak, um, I, I feel like there's a lot of um, femme representation in sapphic literature, but I, and there's definitely like mask and butch liter, uh, representation in literature, but I feel like it's harder to come across and harder um, to enter like the mainstream and everything. Um, so when it came to time to like sit down and write uh, these characters, I, uh, I knew that I could write from the experience of a femme by woman because that's, that's what I am. Um, and then when it came to, uh, I wanted to have a butch love interest uh, in, in the story because I thought that it was really important for kids to have that kind of representation. Um, and then I think like from there, I really wanted to make it a very like queer inclusive uh, kind of little community on the island because one of the things that I think that like, really frustrates me sometimes when I'm reading queer literature in particular, if it's set in like, um, it, it, in, it, I, I think that it's it's frustrating when you like read about literature that's set in like rural communities is that they kind of make it seem like it's very hard for queer people to thrive there or like queer people don't like exist there. Um, speaking as somebody that grew up in the Midwest and people are like, there's queer culture here. Um, and then I've also lived in the South where people are like, there's queer culture there. Uh, that's th th like people are still very surprised when I tell them that Atlanta is home to like one of the last like lesbian bars in the U.S., um, and so I wanted to just kind of make this as, as queer as, um, possible. So I included the representation with, uh, Tomai. And then when it came to including other types of, uh, representation, I know that there's uh, a polyamorous relationship that's in the story as well. Um, and that actually is kind of more so like based on, uh, that actually is kind of more so based on these, um, like just reflecting on some characters and another piece of media that inspired uh, the work um, and kind of reimagining what th that character's dynamic would have looked like. So, yeah. Yeah, when we got to that storyline, I was like, oh, yay. Because <laughs> I, I have not, anything we've read previously has not included that. So I was so excited to finally get a book that included that. Yeah, I really loved, um, I've got polyamorous friends and um, po polyamorous friends, a lot of polyamorous friends. And so I was like, it's so weird that like, we don't have a lot of representation, I think, for like non-normative families or like non-nuclear families, even though like there's a lot of, there's a lot of different types of families. And so one of the things that I thought was really cute about the book is that it has uh, the representation of like a family that maybe just is not traditional. And I think that that's cool. It was a great addition. Yeah, definitely needed. So thank you for that. 
sorry. I had a dog issue. Okay. So <laughs> as I mentioned previously, paranormal supernatural books are one of my favorite things to read. And they're always so different because it basically your imagination's free to create the world. So how did you develop the rules and ways of the supernatural world? Yeah, that, that is an excellent question. So I think that I've always really loved ghost stories. So I've loved things like Casper the Friendly Ghost and like all those little Disney movies that came out when I was a kid. I also really loved um, Kendar Blake's Anna Dressed in Blood series. And then just a fan of like Ghostbusters. And then Danny Phantom was also another significant influence for the book. I will, that that's kind of, I think where like the polyamorous rep came, came from is because um, if you remember, um, if you remember uh, like, the show or if you know about the show at all there's like Danny's parents and then there's like this one guy that is Vlad who is like their college friend and Vlad and uh, Vlad has like this very like interesting relationship with them like throughout the entire series where like he was kind of in love with the mom and then you know he was also but he also like has a strong like relationship with the dad even though he thinks the dad's kind of a loser um and I was like this would be so interesting to explore like explore in like a healthy way where one person is not like a villain um I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent there. So yes, so the uh, the, the um, other kind of representation, uh, the other kind of um, influences came from things like Ghostbusters, Danny Phantom, things like that. And so when I sat down to sort of write this story, I wanted it to have a little bit of a component where it's about a girl that's sort of trying to break down her worldview or like the things that she was taught and trying to unlearn them. That's like a large um, part of the book. But when I was writing it, I think I remember writing it before like really incorporating those epigraphs that came at the beginning of each chapter. Mm -hmm. And I remember just thinking there's a lot of lore that I want to put into this book that doesn't necessarily make sense to put in the context of the storyline. Like no one's going to sit down and necessarily explain. One of the things that I think peeves me off, like is a big pet peeve for me about um, like fantasy books and things like that is when there's like these long monologues about them just trying to explain something. And it's like, but they already exist in this world. Why would, why would we need to be explaining it? So then I realized that the epigraphs could be a really good way to kind of um, build in like that, the world and like those sources and things like that. Um, and that's like something, I think that the epigraphs came to me, I, I really should thank like Tiffany D. Jackson, like the weight of blood, because she's incorporated like uh, in, in the weight of blood, if you ever read that one, um, it's got like podcast interviews and like transcriptions in it. Um, How to Succeed in Witchcraft by Ashlyn Brophy also has like some of these epigraphs at the beginning. And I was like, this is like a really excellent way to kind of build in a world um, and make it a very rich world without making it too dense. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> no, I agree. I love the epic. Like I was, oh, when I first got to the first epigraph, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Because I'm like, what is this tome? Like it, it already intrigues you because you're like, what is, my first question was, what is the lore? What does this book mean? Like who wrote this? And so I do like that you sprinkled that out. I agree. I think that is a good way to keep the characters realistic because you're right in, in the world. Why would they be having, it is weird. Right. They're like, let me just briefly explain this thing. I knew my whole life and you're right, a reader, right. Like, why are you telling me <laughs> this? You just know this. It's weird. So yeah, no, that was a great way to like, it also kind of like keeps a bit of separation because you almost have like, in your brain two plots going on you're like what's the character doing and then like what is the bigger overarching picture so right epigraph is a great way to do that i love that a lot yeah thank you yeah i thought yeah. that it was also a really cool way in in my mind um when it comes to like the ghost hunting in the book and like the technologies that they use like mm -hmm. i i kind of think that the technologies are am i allowed to swear on the podcast oh yeah. yes <laughs> okay so i think that the technologies that actually a lot of the ghost hunters use are complete bullshit and it's like a capitalistic <laughs> scheme to like try to get people to invest in these things like they succeed in getting the ghosts in my in my mind and this is not explored in the te in the um the book explicitly but in my mind like people like someone just made this company to sell like ghost hunting equipment to make it easier to get rid of ghosts instead of actually doing like the proper practices that mm -hmm. the ghost hunters have been refining over like years and years and things like that and i was kind of i was kind of like how do i i don't want like 
that to be necessarily illustrated in the story because there's already so much going on in the story as well. But the epigraphs, there's like lines and like conversations and things where they're kind of like Leona uh, Giles um, is sort of criticizing the use of like the equipment and things like that and trying to say that the ghost hunters have strayed from their path. And mm -hmm. that's not something that can fit in the book, but that I, I think that I think is something that can fit in kind of this background of, um, you know, Melody is trying to unlearn everything that she thinks that she knows about ghost hunting. And she's trying to challenge that because one way that she's been presented her whole life is not necessarily the right way or the only way or the correct way. Um, but I think that it's able to do that without taking a huge focus in the story. There was something in the beginning of the book. And I think it was like either an illness, disease, where about something with ectoplasm. I think. Yes, ectitis. Yeah, yeah, ectitis. Okay. Ect oh, I, I don't know how I spell it, but yeah. <laughs> My dumbass thought this was a real thing, and I was about to text Theora and be like, "Hey, what is this?" And then uh, luckily, <laughs> I googled it before texting oh Theora. God. It's inflammation from ectoplasm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Damn, that was so clever!" Because yeah, like if you had, I love that because I I work in medicine, and I thought that was really clever because I'm like, yeah, if you had all these things, like you're going, people are gonna have like reactions yeah. to it and have like diseases specific to this ghost hunting i love that detail that was a really detail I'm like finally Thank somebody you. did it i was also thinking about how like ectoplasm is so wet i'm like there would be so if ectoplasm was a real thing there would be so much mold like there is no way that like you can't convince me that someone wouldn't get sick from like working with ghosts at least at some point no, so, yeah. for real. And I love the realism when you're like, you had like Melody walking through this house and it's just like, it's everywhere. And I was like, right. <laughs> everywhere. Like, yeah, it was very yeah. realistic. Um, one thing I love that you did with the book with the, the ghost hunters is you kind of, you made them almost like you frame them almost as like this cultural entity versus this like job. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of times like ghostbusters yeah. they're there, it's a job they do. It's just a quirky job, but like they were right. like this, it's almost like a, I don't want to say like indigenous community, but it's a, like, it felt like this like really old timey, like community that's been passed down through generations. And like, I love that it, it's a culture more so than less like a function. That was right. a nice twist. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to, so I knew I won't spoil like who the villain was, but I knew when I sat down to write this book, when I knew, like, I knew the components were like ghost music and then the twist villain that's sort of at the end there i knew that i wanted to use like another like fantasy creature for that mm -hmm. um but i was like it, it I, I was just like i don't think that it's going to make sense to have other fantasy creatures present in this world unless and it, and just be like well ghost hunters are just not fantasy creature it, it just it felt like it wasn't gonna vibe with like the world um and so i was like it would be interesting to kind of explore this from like a cultural perspective instead of just as a job because who would want to be a go i i feel like if it's right. a cultural thing more people would want to be like feel compelled to be a ghost hunter um but if it's just a job it's like why would you volunteer yourself for that why would a lot of people like volunteer themselves for that yeah that's that's fair. Yeah, no, fair. definitely, definitely fair. Uh, okay, so you you talked a little bit about like media that influenced you and in crafting the book. Were there any other personal experience you had that influenced the creation of Haunting Melody? Yeah, um, so Haunting Melody is a book that uh, centers on a, a teenage girl with PTSD. I have PTSD. Um, I went through some very traumatic incidents like a, a few years uh, a few years back, uh, one of which included a sexual assault. Um, the other which included witnessing um, a shooting at my apartment complex. Um, and so these two events kind of happened in the time span of like less than six months. So it was just kind of multiple, uh, traumatic events that compounded, um, to sort of led, which kind of put me in this moment where I was sort of having a, a, a breakdown. Um, and I've had like depression and anxiety, like a lot of my life. Um, I've, I, you know, I've had it since I was like in my teens. Um, so that was familiar to me, but PTSD was just this whole other different alienating ball game because in, in some ways I felt like I was a stranger in my body. Um, and in some ways when you experience things like flashbacks, like, I know I knew like written down like what a flashback was. I didn't know what it was supposed to feel like and it felt like I was being split in two uh two different places at once. Um and I was like this is just such an alienating uh like 
disease to, I, I, well, disorder, I should say it's a disorder to live with. And it's very, um, it changes your life in ways that I think that you, you don't necessarily expect. Like I still can't necessarily like listen to, I live right next to a baseball stadium, which sometimes sets off fireworks. Sometimes I'm having flashbacks when there's fireworks going off. Um, and I like, I've never, it doesn't happen all the time now. Thank goodness. Um, but I haven't gotten to a point where I feel, I, I guess there's this, there's this idea that PTSD is supposed to go away after a certain amount of time and not, it, that's not the case. Like it, it does get easier to manage in time. Um, and so I was like, I'm not the only person in the world that has PTSD. <laughs> like it's actually, it's a very, very common disorder to have. Um, and I think that it's very easy to develop it. Um, so I think that with uh, the the uh, with that, I was like, there's got to be some kids out there in the world that maybe have PTSD that would need to like see some kind of blueprint for what life looks like after uh, developing this disorder. Because I remember being afraid to leave my house. I remember thinking nothing was ever going to be okay again. Um, and it was. I just had to put in a lot of work to do it. Um, so I think that that's one major thing that th th that's like one major thing that's definitely influenced this book is that I wanted it to be more about um, sort of the recovery and like life after what that looks like, because I think that when you first get diagnosed with the disorder, like you feel a deep, deep sense of hopelessness. I am very grateful that you're willing to share your personal story oh, thank and you. that you have dealt with this in your art basically yeah i have all of the above that you've talked about and poor theora has to deal with my ptsd because a car accident she has to play oh, watch no. media for me sometimes oh yeah <laughs> so i'm like is there a car she's like stop there's no car accidents in there <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah so it's just i love when people take pain and just that that really is what art is about yeah was there a particular moment in Haunting Melody that felt cathartic or healing for you to write, given your personal experiences with trauma? Yeah, I think that what felt cathartic for me to write was definitely that kind of conversation that she and Cyrus have in like that little like playhouse that's like out in the woods behind some, um, I, I, behind like Tomai's house. Um, I think that that particular sort of moment is where she's just having this meltdown and she's just like, I can't get, I can't get my shit together. Like no matter what I do, I can't, I can't get it together. Like there's just going to be some part of my brain that is forever changed. Um, there's some parts of my body that are forever changed. Um, and I feel like sh she feels, I feel like with PTSD, there's a sense of like a loss of control. And with her, um, I think that uh, it's, it's, I, I think that what was cathartic for me is that she kind of tells all these things to Cyrus. She kind of like dumps all this information on Cyrus. And Cyrus is this person that just like embraces all of these anxieties, like lets her get them out of her system. Um, and then just kind of says, like, we have good bodies, we have good brains. Um, that I think was really important for me in particular, because I was just like, wow, my brain is broken. Uh, my body is never going to be the same. My brain is never going to be the same, same again. My body is never going to be the same again. Um, and yeah, maybe it's never going to be the same again, but it doesn't mean that it's broken. And it doesn't mean that I'm undeserving of love or that I can't move forward. It just might mean that I need some like more help sometimes. And like, remember the tools that I was given by like the therapist that I've spent time with. I, I love all of that. Everything that you're saying is just so beautiful. And I love that. Well, thank you. You're able to communicate that through this book. And I'm sure that people reading it it's going to resonate with them if they've had these experiences as well. But even for people who haven't, it's just really good reminder that there are people with experiences like that who may need a little guidance or understanding. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think with PTSD, I think it's easy for people to get into this mindset of why can't someone get over it? And it's like, your brain is chemically changed. <laughs> like your brain has been biologic. Like you can't, you, you can't like, change it back. Um, and it's an adjustment to try to figure out how it works. I know, especially like when it comes to triggers, like I start to get triggered by very like 
random things. Like for me, I can watch gun violence on, on television and a movie and I'm fine. If I hear a banging noise and I don't see where it's coming from, I'm not fine, which I'm like, that feels a little ridiculous, but I'm like, that's just how my brain works now. Uh, so yeah. Well, there's kind of like a little bit of unknown, like you can see exactly what's happening, but like right. if you don't know where it is. Right. If you don't know where it is. And in that particular situation, I did not know what was going on until like I looked outside and I saw what was um, going on. Um, so like that, that I guess was just kind of something that was interesting for me to discover. And I think that um, like Melody kind of discovers like small things throughout the book that like tend to trigger her. And then she's like learning to adapt with that as well. Like if Cyrus tries to touch her, she gets a little overwhelmed. If she hears certain sounds, I think she also gets like a little bit overwhelmed. Um, so I think that like, triggers um, sometimes just aren't like the obvious things that you would think of. I think sometimes they're very small and like subtle. And then also like, there's a common thing of like only soldiers get PTSD. Yes. Yeah. Then that just is not the case. That's not, that's not true. I know a lot of people who have um, PTSD from, from like, I know people who have PTSD from sexual assaults. I think it's very common to develop uh, PTSD after sexual assaults. Um, I think it's also very common to develop. Uh, th there's also things like CPTSD. I have a friend who does have CPTSD, like complex because um, it's compounded like in childhood. It's just like constant traumatic events that eventually just kind of change the landscape. Of, I guess the landscape of your brain. Um, and like, there are a lot of things that can actually cause PTSD, which is, uh, why I was kind of like, it's interesting that we don't talk a lot explicitly about PTSD. We talk about trauma in fiction, but not explicitly PTSD. And it's it's very common and like a lot of, uh, you know, different things can happen to, thing, uh, a bunch of different things can happen to kind of cause it, um, which I, I think is like less known for sure. Yeah. yeah, You so you mentioned that basically that you thought it was important to show somebody as a protagonist who's recovering from PTSD mm -hmm. versus like a character that's actively experiencing the trauma, which is much more common. So how did right. that, with that in mind, how did that alter your approach to like writing the story? Yeah, so I would say that with um, Monster Sona, which is the previous work that I've released with Tiny Ghost Press, um, and uh, that was my previous YA work, Monster Sona, uh, was largely edited during the time that I was like first initially diagnosed. So that book, um, as I was like kind of learning to like edit it, edit it and like go through it again, I realized that it was a book that was kind of about um, the onset of PTSD. And so with Monster Sona kind of being a book that was about the onset of PTSD, as I was editing it and going through um, therapy, uh, going through therapy prior to the release of that book, um, I started to kind of learn different sort of techniques and sort of to kind of like adjust and like get my mental state back to a better place. Um, and that's how I was able to kind of write Haunting Melody. So like the difference between the two books is definitely very stark because Monster Sona is very dark. It's very foreboding. There's not like a lot of there's not necessarily like a lot of hope in that book. Um, and this book, I wanted it to definitely be like a little bit more op optimistic and opposite in tone. Um, so one of the things that I knew when I wrote Haunting Melody is that while Monster Sona is sci-fi horror, um, I wanted uh, Haunting Melody to be more about a um, more optimistic and happy. I wanted to kind of feel like a Disney Channel original movie. It's just that this one person has, this one person just has this disorder and she's got to learn how to work with that. Um, so I think that if I hadn't written Monster Sona, I would have really struggled at writing Haunting Melody. But because I knew where I had taken things with Monster Sona, which centered on that onset, I was able to kind of separate those things out and figure out what I needed to change in this book. Um, what things I needed to kind of keep consistent um, in terms of like um, side effects, symptoms, things like that. Um, but what things I needed to change. So Disney Channel original movie, if they tackled mental health in a healthy manner. Yes, exactly. Yes. I wanted it to feel like Halloween Town kind of. Um, yeah. I also <laughs> 
love Gravity Falls. Gravity Falls is like one of my favorite shows. I don't have any artwork from Gravity Falls on my wall behind me, which is unfortunate and I need to fix that. Um, but Gravity Falls, like I wanted it to kind of feel like Gravity Falls just like with queer characters. So I wanted it to be creepy and definitely have the sense of dread and um, like definitely things to fear because one of the things that I think Gravity Falls did really well for kids is like scaring them, but also giving them the sense of hope at the end of the episode that everything's going to be okay. Uh, so so that that definitely uh that definitely that was also like another like huge influence that I think went into developing the book in terms of trying to balance the scary but balance the funny. Yeah. Um in the book, music plays a large role. And I noticed that you usually create playlists for readers to listen to while reading your books. Yes. If you had to pick one song to be like a theme song for Haunting Melody, what would it be? Oh my gosh. Do you mind if I pull up the playlist real quick to just go ahead? Oh, it? Okay. Do it. Do it. Yes, do it. because a part of me wants to say Beach Bunny's Weeds, um, because that is literally just the song is about um, somebody who has like anxiety or has like a really big self uh, like problem with their self image. Um, but I feel like that's not necessarily as hopeful or as. Let me see. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yes, the theme song that I would use for Haunting Melody would definitely be um, Carol uh, Caroline uh, Palachek's Welcome to My Island, because <laughs> I think that it's about, um, there's there's a lyric that she says, where she says, welcome to my island, hope you like, uh, hope you like me, you're not, uh, gosh, what is the lyric, let me see here, welcome to my island, let me see, um, she, hope you like me you ain't leaving and then it kind of talks about uh desire and there's like a lot of other lyrics that kind of pertain to desire and i was like i think it's really funny that i was able to find like this song that sort of connected to the idea of arriving on an island and kind of starting fresh um which a lot of the book is about starting fresh and trying to start anew um but then there's also like a huge component about um desire as melody kind of grapples with her feelings for cyrus so that i think is what i would say is the um theme song it's amazing how music perfect. can like perfectly describe a piece of media um side note i noticed in another playlist you have you had seven uh by taylor swift so are oh, you yeah. a swifty at all I am a little bit of a Swifty. Admittedly, I, I'm not a big fan of her, like, the, I'm not a big fan of, like, the last two albums that she put out, but I really love Folklore, and Folklore was definitely one of, like, Folklore is, like, one of these comfort albums for me that I revisit, um, but I've been a lifelong Taylor Swift fan. I uh, went to, like, the Speak Now concert when I was a kid, and that, that was a very nice. cool concert. Yeah, for sure. Sounds awesome. We... Uh, relate a bunch of Taylor Swift songs to media, so I just had to bring it up. <laughs> yeah, seven is just such a really good way, uh, d good one to like, uh, uh, like kind of tie back to like work that I've written. I think that that one, I want to say that one was on the Monster Sona playlist, and then. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then um, My Tears Ricochet is another one that I really, really love. Um, and that hasn't influenced like Haunting Melody or anything, but it's influenced like a lot of other works that I've written, like the idea of if I'm dead to you, why are you at the wake? Um, cursing my name, wishing I've stayed. And I think that that's a really excellent song to kind of illustrate like uh, like a breakup and things like that. It, that I, I go back to that one all the time. I love that one. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's a perfect one for paranormal stuff. It's, yes. It's good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so back to the book. Melody's goal uh, to redeem herself after her failed hunt is this central theme, something she beats herself up about quite a bit. How did you explore the idea of self-worth and redemption? And how does Melody's journey mirror that of someone in recovery? That's okay. Those, th that's a really excellent question. Um, I think that I knew I wanted her to kind of be this person that was very, despite the things that she's been, that she's been through, I wanted her to be extremely driven, um, and kind of, uh, like desperate almost in a way to like get through this, uh, particular, to, to get to the bottom of this particular mystery. Um, cause I think that, 
there are little things that we do sometimes when we're trying to recover from a mental illness or trying to like, um, I guess, reframe our way of thinking. We kind of pick like one thing that we can sort of focus on as like a central goal. Um, maybe for some people, it's like being able to leave their house. Um, maybe for some people, it's like, I want to be able to watch this violent movie without it like uh, without me needing to turn it off. Or maybe it's, I want to be able to go to this place again where this really bad thing happened and like have a good time. Um, and for so thinking about that and then thinking about um, Melody and how she, I think, is tying the idea of solving this mystery as a way to go back to who she was in the beginning, as a way to kind of prove that she is the same girl that her um, everyone always thought that she was. Um, and I think that that is kind of what adds in this sense of desperation and ambition for her. Um, as she kind of progresses throughout the book, though, it sort of becomes clear that maybe in some ways, like she's not necessarily ready to take on like solving a mystery all by herself, especially when she's never solved a mystery before. Uh, she's she's bold in that way. Um, I love love the confidence, girly, but what are you thinking? Um, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so like there are some things that I think if you're really excited about recovery or you're just like, I need, th I need this to be over. I need this to be over and I need to go back to how my life was before. There are times where I think you're going to challenge yourself in ways where that's not necessarily like healthy or like the best thing to do. Um, and you know, you're going to push yourself really way too hard and it's going to actually like backfire on you. Like she has instances where she's kind of like having, um, she has instances where she's kind of like having, um, I guess, I guess the word for it would be like a little bit of like a meltdown or like a panic attack, things like that. Um, where it's, it's, she's kind of going backwards. Um, so I think in some ways, like her journey is like about taking those setbacks and, and things like that. Um, but then, uh, you know, you have the involvement of Cyrus, Cyrus, who is, despite understanding that there's like a, a murder mystery going on and that some of it's been pinned on her, Cyrus, I think, is so patient and has like almost uh, better sort of skills to kind of cope with stress. So Cyrus is the one that sort of steps in to encourage her to like, hey, um, you should probably like eat breakfast this morning before you leave the house. Like we wouldn't want anything bad to happen to you. Like no, no, nothing's going to get solved any faster because you decided to skip breakfast. You're just going to pass out. Um, and Cyrus is the one that kind of encourages her to calm down and like take a deep breath and like take a moment and really slow down. Um, so I think that that's kind of how the idea of like um, self, uh, like the, the idea of the redemption is kind of explored in that. Um, in terms of the self-worth, I think that with the self-worth, um, she kind of gets to the end of the story and realizes that oh, like my family loves me. They're just concerned about me. And they were just trying to like, they, they, they were the ones that messed up, um, in this particular, uh, in this particular book. Um, they were the ones that messed up and they were just trying to protect me and they are human and they make mistakes and they fuck up quite a bit. Um, and they're not skilled with words. Melody's dad, especially is not skilled with words. Um, so I think she gets to this point where like she realizes that um, self-worth is just something that you have to work on, that uh, people in her life still love and support her, um, and that she didn't need to solve like this murder mystery necessarily to redeem herself in that sense. That, that makes total sense. And again, I just love it. You have created such a beautiful book. Thank you. Thank you. I, that really means a lot to me because this is just, yeah, I mean, you never, you never know how um, people are going to respond to things with like, um, I think, especially with like femmes that are um, kind of coping, coping with like chronic illness or like mental illness. Like sometimes I'll see reviews for like not my books, but like other books where it's like this particular, per this person is so annoying. And I'm like, this person literally has a mental I, I would be a little bit nicer, but like this person has a mental disorder. I think that you need to give them some grace and some patience because that's what the story is trying to explore. Um, so you always just, I think that when I sit down to write stories about characters who have like a mental illness or like a disorder that they're coping with, like there's always this thing in the back of my head where I worry someone's going to think that this person's annoying. Someone's, what if they're not going to get it? And I'm 
just really excited to see that like there's people that get it and people that connect with it and people that understand because that's that's so important for somebody that is struggling with mental illness even if they don't get it it's still making them feel something yes yes <laughs> that is true that is true yeah even if even if i guess even if you come away from the book feeling like you don't necessarily understand everything that happened maybe it's thinking making you like think about things a little bit better there are still a lot of people that might have that melody mindset where it's like all i need to do is just do it and then i can get through it and it's gonna be fine and it's like no that's not that's not how this works you're actually you're probably gonna make things worse um so yeah i think that that's definitely i i, I hope that for people who can't connect to it or relate to it that it pushes them to a point of understanding or wanting to understand and explore these things more so we do have two spoilery questions, if you're okay Ooh, with that. I'm so excited, yes. <laughs> okay, so for anybody who has not read the book yet, go forward like 10-ish minutes. Or go read the book and then come back. Either way, if Haunting Melody were turned into an interactive experience, like a video game Ooh. or choose your own adventure, which decision point in the story would you let readers change and why? Oh gosh, the decision point in the story that I would let readers change and why. I think, gosh, that's a really good question. I think that a decision point, and if I was to like remake it in a way where like it could have like a branching narrative and it could have like multiple different endings kind of thing, I think yeah. that actually it could be interesting to have um, Melody uh decide maybe not to work with cyrus i think that that could be an interesting way to explore um because it is kind of presented to her as like this choice so um like choice whether or not like to work with the ghost or not it could i think be interesting if melody maybe worked less with ghosts and worked more with like tomaya and trying to solve um the to, to to solve the the mystery i think that that could be a interesting um place to go go to right yeah it would change the entire story right yeah it would change the entire story for sure and then i think that there's always going to be this um idea that cyrus uh i think that there would always be this sense of mystery about cyrus as you're trying to connect things mm -hmm. i also think that maybe another change I could make is maybe Melody and Cyrus don't leave the theater when they realize that Cyrus might be like getting set up to like take the fall for the murders. Um, I think it could be interesting if instead of like they double back to Melody's house, maybe they go somewhere else trying to be like a little bit more remote, which I think could um, be a dumber decision in some ways because it's like, you have to like, I don't even know, like, then Melody would just be reported as a runaway, but I think that that could be another interesting way to sort of explore things if Melody, like, ran away from home with Cyrus to try to avoid detection and things like that. She was like, no, Simon's going to figure this out. I, I got to go. <laughs> yeah, just leave all the resources behind. Right? Just, yeah, just leave all the resources behind. That's the hard mode. That's the hard mode ending. Right. You get the extra <laughs> special. <laughs> Challenge mode. <laughs> you get the extra special ending or, or something. You unlock a special ending. <laughs> well, speaking of the ending. So at the end of the book, Simon makes something that reverses Cyrus's transition into becoming a wraith. I'm curious. Is this something she can use indefinitely or will they have to deal with the inevitability of losing each other at some point? That's a really good question. So if Haunting Melody ever gets a... I, I, sequels are dependent upon like sales is I'm just, I'm just going to say like publishing his business sequels are dependent upon sales, but I have given a lot of thought to this because one of the concerns that I think I have with Cyrus and Melody staying together is that Melody is going to age and Cyrus is not going to age because yes. Cyrus is stuck at this. Um, what I was thinking is that they would be, uh, if if I had a sequel in mind, I would want them to maybe go to the mainland, uh, check out some colleges and things like that, and maybe um, form relationships with other mediums who can teach Melody kind of more about the old ways in ways that Simon doesn't necessarily understand. I think that uh, there could be other kind of like potions or salves or devices that they could use that could kind of help Cyrus like 
age in a way. But I also think that the idea of necromancy could be really interesting to explore or like recreating some some kind of like temporary body or like vessel that she can use. Um, I think that there's like a, a couple of different ways that like you can explore it um, and a, diff a couple different ways that you can challenge it. Uh, so I, I definitely think that when it comes to the South, like the South is going to stop working at a certain point, or she's just going to need to explore, uh, different and more kinds of things for sure. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I do have another question that I just thought of, and I don't know if I just missed something, but I believe that ghost hunters are special in the way that they can see ghosts and like other people can't. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so okay. if if a ghost has the decision, if the ghost has the ability to, um, ghosts generally have an ability to, like, hide themselves, but hunters have, I guess, this, I think I explained it as, like, being able to see, like, the certain, like, light wavelength that ghosts mm -hmm. occupy or something um, that he, regular humans can't, yeah. Okay, so Cyrus just wants to be seen. Like it's only yeah, Cyrus. Got it. Yeah, Cyrus okay. wants to be seen. Yeah, Cyrus wants to be seen, and I think that even Cyrus, like even I think, like struggles to. They do turn invisible at one point in the book, like her and Melody together. But I think mm -hmm. that even there's a struggle to kind of maintain that um, invisibility for sure. Mm. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Yeah, that that was actually a very confused that that confused us like a couple times because we forgot that that was like one of the, the plot points for the ghost hunters. And like, especially with the invisibility scene, I'm going to be honest, like me and my editor went back and forth on like that to try to like make it less confusing and like try to understand it because yeah, that, that that's that's that was an interesting kind of caveat about sort of designing the world uh, with the ghost hunters and the ghosts. Yeah. Especially with Melody, not Melody, Cyrus, like, joining the world, basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so that concludes the spoilery stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it is now safe to return if you are listening to this. <laughs> anyway, I noticed that you are also a filmmaker. Yeah, yeah. Any hopes to one day turn Melody's story into a film? I, I hope so. I really hope that someone, I would, I think that it could make like a cute animated series if it was just like about, about like these teenage kids on like this, uh, on the island, like, or hopping like over to the mainland to try to solve, um, like different, uh, figure out like how to get ghosts to cross over, trying to like unlearn like ghost hunting practices and things like that and like learn new techniques. I would love for it to be like a TV series. I would love for it to be a film. I really think Disney Channel um would be great, but I know that they have been a little bit a little bit uh uh homophobic as of late. Um yes. given like the decisions that they've made to like axe the Owl House and thing things like that. Um I think that they've like axed a lot of their like their queer media in general, which is just kind of ridiculous to me because that seems to be the things that people want to see. Um, and the I could I could go on I could go on for like another thirty minutes alone on the Owl House cancellation and how mad that still makes me. Um, but I will not. Wow. I will not. Um, but yeah, I think that there could definitely. I would I I would love to sit down and maybe like write a film script for it at the at this point, but right now I kind of want the book to just get out in the world and sort of uh look at thing uh sort of get more feedback from audiences and things like that. Um because sometimes I think with like film and like TV adaptations, people want it to be like a a play by play of like the actual book, which I think is fine. But I personally like to look at my work and see how I would change it to screen and maybe that means taking like some cre different creative choices uh like right now i'm working on a script for like a separate like adult body horror novella um and there's definitely going to be some things that deviate from the original plot just to kind of support like a film structure better yeah, yeah. that makes sense all right. Related, but not related. If the characters in your book could meet the characters in a queer TV show and interact in the show's world, which show would you choose? Oh, my gosh. I Now that I said the Owl House, that's going to be the only thing that's stuck in my head. I, I think know. that they would love. 
<laughs> the owl house they would they would love to meet the kids from the owl house and i think that they would have a really great time together uh i think that it would be really cool to kind of see how the owl house's like version of magic might contrast from uh like haunting melody's idea of like magic because there are witches in haunting melody they're just not like no one none of the main characters are a witch they're they're yeah. just kind of like mentioned in passing um so i think that, that could be very cool for sure have you ever watched Yellow Jackets? Yes. Yes, I love okay. Yellow Jackets. Yeah. So I feel like if these two worlds collide, that would make one hell of a show. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, that could wild. be so scary. I can't wait for the next season of Yellow Jackets. That's gonna be I so love good. Yellow Jackets. Oh, my God. It's so good. So good. Yeah. That could be so fun. That could be so fun to see cannibalism and... <laughs> <laughs> Them wa happening. lost in the woods, <laughs> learning how to survive. I feel like Tomai would really struggle out there in the wilderness. <laughs> I feel like Melody might be like, oh, this is nice. I get to be one with nature again. Cyrus would probably be indifferent, and Tomai would be like, I'm dying here. I'm struggling. <laughs> but then also they could bring back all the people who's died in Yellow Jackets. And yeah. they can like, mm -hmm. communicate what's happened. Yeah. That could be cool. Yeah, Melody's just like, so this this person did this, that person did that. Um, don't trust Misty. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Bottom line, don't trust Misty. Don't trust Misty. <laughs> Spoiler. Oh that that it's that so reveal <laughs> that one made me mad. I hope that I I'm really interested to see if they ever figured out that it was Misty that destroyed that box. I know. I, I don't I will know. cut out the spoiler stuff for Yellow Jackets. Oh, don't worry. I yes. just, we need to, we just need to talk. Yeah. No, literally no. though. I was just like, how, how are they still even talking to her like years later? I don't even, it's fine. <laughs> it's a, when we get to it, we're, it's going to be so much talking about it. Yeah. Anyway, back to the <laughs> book. Uh, our last question is, what do you hope people take away from reading this book? That's a really good question. I think that I, what I hope people take away from reading the book is that I think you need to have patience with other people and understand what they're going through. Um, and that I think is for the people that like don't have PTSD, the people that don't have PTSD, I just want them to like be patient and learn something and maybe like take something with them um, and understand that like, uh, some people have like these individual struggles that they're going through that you might not necessarily know a lot about. Um, and then when it comes to like people who do have PTSD, I do want them to understand that like your life might be changed, but just because it's changed doesn't mean that it's ruined. Doesn't mean that like there's not something small that you can put together to kind of get through, um, to, to kind of get through your day to day and also um, improve upon your life. I think that one of the things is you, you might feel like very afraid and very scared to confront the world. And maybe there's just some things that you're not going to be able to do again or that you don't want to do again. Um, and that's okay. Like it's okay for things to change. Um, you can still just kind of build a beautiful life with like the, what you have. Um, your world hasn't shrunk. Um, it can grow. It's just going to grow in different ways. That, that's I so love beautiful. That. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chloe. This is this concludes the interview. We appreciate you taking the time to come talk to us today so we can get to know you. Our listeners could get to know you. Before we officially sign off, are there any words of wisdom you'd like to leave the audience with? Oh, yes. Um, there is an environmental component to this book that I don't think um, that I didn't really take the chance to discuss, but I would just say, uh, recycle, reduce, reuse, recycle, um, and try <laughs> yep. to explore greener options. Try to, um, take, uh, try to find ways to take care of your community, even if it's small, um, and not very time consuming. Find ways to take care of your community. That is okay calling it a beautification committee, even though it's actually an environmental protection yes. committee. Yes. <laughs> they can't use the word climate change. Right. No, exactly. <laughs> Language yeah. matters. Indeed. That's a great way to end this. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you, Chloe. For everybody listening at home, please check out Haunting Melody. 
how can people connect with you on the internet if they want to follow you or support you, Chloe? Yeah, I think that the best way to um, to kind of uh, follow me is by going to my website at chloespenceronline.com. I think that you can also follow me on Instagram and TikTok where I'm at It's Hates Chloe Spencer. I'm on Twitter too, but not as active on Twitter. Um, Loki might delete my Twitter. Not sure. Kind of thinking it over. But yeah, Instagram, Alex. TikTok at Hey, it's Chloe Spencer. <laughs> All right, you heard it here, everyone. So until next time, hydrate for lesbian Jesus. And gay it up all over the place. Bye. Bye. And with that, we've been Big Gay Energy. If you like this episode, check out all our other episodes right here on YouTube. Please like, leave a comment below, and subscribe for more amazing super gay content.